Welcome to ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News. The program you're about to see is free to watch, courtesy of YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. But it wasn't free to make. ARVN's got a lot of money invested in video equipment like this sweet camera and that editing system back there. And it takes a lot of time to shoot and edit a program like this. So I'm asking you to make a voluntary payment, contribution, whatever you want to call it. Just stop by our website, arvn.tv, and you'll see a link to make that payment, whatever you think the program is worth to you. I guess you could say that this program is brought to you by you. So thanks for watching and enjoy the show. So let's do some introductions here. We've got a couple of gentlemen on the line here. Charles Brain, G4GUO. Say hello, Charles. Hello, everyone. I hope you all had a nice lunch and you're not going to fall asleep on us. And Charles, your QTH? I'm located on the south coast of England near a place called Worthing. So um, right by the sea. Okay, so, and we also have Ken... I'm going to mess this up. Uh, W6HHC. Okay, that's good. Thank you for bailing me out there. And Ken, your QTH? Uh, Orange, California. Okay, so we've got uh, Charles and Ken obviously presenting to us remotely, and you are coming in loud and clear, you two, and, it's, uh, and you're very clear here in the conference room. And they're going to talk about DATV Express, a lower cost approach to digital amateur television. Take it away, Charles and Ken. Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the ARRL Tapper Digital Communication Conference. And uh, yeah, the topic of our presentation is digital amateur television. And uh, let me just give you a little bit uh, more uh, background. This is uh, Ken W6 uh, Hotel, Hotel Canada talking. But basically, I got involved with uh, digital amateur television a little bit more than two and a half years ago. And uh, my motivation was I'm involved with a local races group here in the city of Orange. And uh, we had been struggling with problems with analog amateur television. Uh, the quality of signals being sent from the field uh, just were terrible. Uh, too much multi-path reflection, uh, very weak signals coming in that were full of snow. And uh, essentially, they were not the quality of video that you'd want to show to the chief of police uh, back at the emergency operations center or the mayor of the city. And so I started playing with digital amateur television to see if it might not solve our problem for emergency communication field transmission. And sure enough, it did. Uh, it was outstanding improvement. Uh, over the older analog ATV technology we had been using in the past and was able to give us uh, clear pictures, perfect pictures in all the places that used to give us so much trouble before. And so um, that's what I've been doing lately uh, before I got involved with this project. And uh, uh, Charles, why don't you give us a little bit more about your background? Uh, well, I've uh, I've also not been using um, doing digital television for very long. I've been doing it for a couple of years. What interested me in doing it was um, actually it was a sort of offshoot of the uh, HPSDR in that um, that's all fairly narrowband stuff. Whereas I wanted um, I wanted to try some really wideband stuff, and uh, obviously digital television normally it uh, uses uh, eight megahertz channels. Um, not amateur stuff, but the commercial stuff. So it seemed an ideal thing to have a play with, to write code that runs at very high speed and uh, pumps uh, very, very high data rates out over the air. So that's what got me into digital television. Although having said that, about 20 years ago, I had a look go with analog. And as Ken said, the quality of it was pretty awful. And um, it was very difficult to get a, a decent signal out. But with digital, you can basically transmit um, broadcast quality programming. No two, pr two ways about it. It's uh, almost indistinguishable from, um, from real, uh, real television. And also, there's all sorts of digital ser extra services that you can add, high-speed data, teletext, 
subtitling, all sorts of stuff. And there's a heck of a lot of software out on the internet that uh, allows you to manipulate uh, digital uh, video streams and audio streams. So uh, it's it's something that everybody can get involved in, whether you're interested in program making, fiddling around with internet connected stuff, computing, you name it, this covers it all. So uh, I'm really excited about this. Back to you, Ken. Oh, thank you. Well, let's uh, give a status of uh, how I see uh, or how we see digital amateur television today. Uh, basically, the uh, the video quality, as we just talked about, is uh, far exceeds uh, analog ATV uh, technology. Uh, can't be any doubt about that. And of course, there's a lot of other aspects about uh, digital modulation uh, technology that allows you to have smaller bandwidths than the analog ATV. So, a lot of good things to say about ATV. Uh, so it's it's kind of a proven technology now, but. If we look at the United States, uh, there's very few hams transmitting today in uh, transmitting digital amateur television in the United States today. Uh, essentially, there's only uh, two digital amateur television repeaters uh, active uh, today. Uh, the first one is in central Ohio, uh, Columbus. Uh, the uh, repeater, I think it's WR8ATV, uh, went digital in 2004, and they've been 24-7. Uh, transmitting digital amateur television since then. Uh, they've been the pioneers and it's been kind of a lonely uh, settlement uh, for them. Until this past summer, uh, there's a group of ATVers down in the San Diego Del Mar group, uh, Del Mar area, that uh, put a, net, a second digital amateur television repeater up on the air. Uh, their main focus is emergency communications. Uh, basically, they're using digital amateur television to uh, help out with RACES groups, A-R-E-S groups, and also uh, CERT. So uh, not that much activity, trying to make it grow. Uh, but uh, if you compare uh, with Europe, uh, we have a long way to go. Europeans, of course, were the real pioneers. Uh, they got started in the late uh, 1990s. And... Uh, uh, basically, uh, they have many repeaters over there in Europe that are uh, uh, digital amateur television. They have a lot of active uh, transmitting stations, and it's growing. And uh, not only that, but uh, the European hams have been just absolutely wonderful about uh, leaving articles and blogs about uh, uh, their experiences and their techniques and uh, their problems and how they overcame problems. And so they've been a great source of uh, Googling uh, information about digital amateur television. Uh, if you look down in the uh, Australia, New Zealand area, they have more activity on digital amateur television than we have here in the United States also. Uh, matter of fact, uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, a couple weeks ago uh, down in Australia, uh, VK3RTV uh, uh, conducted uh, what was called the first worldwide digital amateur television CUSO party. And I had a chance to participate in that and uh, took my uh, little uh, DVBS uh, digital signal and was able to uh, uh, get a little help from Skype video to have it rebroadcast uh, on the K3 or VK3 RTV uh, digital repeater down there. It was a lot of fun. It was just a hoot and got to meet a lot of other people who are involved in digital amateur TV. And by meet, I could actually see them. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, getting on with the status, uh, one of the problems uh, I see with more people getting involved is uh, digital amateur television transmitters are currently expensive. You really can spend anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000 to get the two main components you need for a transmitter. And that is that uh, typically you need one component that is a uh, MPEG-2 encoder. And then you need another component that is a DVB-S exciter. And uh, those two pieces will cost you somewhere between a total of $1,000 and up. And uh, it definitely is a, a barrier. Uh, we have lots of people we've talked to, especially a lot of current analog ATV users that just won't try it because they have to make a big investment before they try it. 
So what's the goal of this DATV Express project then? Uh, we just talked about the fact that uh, current transmitters are too expensive and that uh, probably the best bargain uh, right now uh, is $4,000. You can get a pair of boards from a German company that's designed for ham radio type use rather than commercial uh, type use and uh, get on the air uh, using off-the-shelf components. Uh, the project, our plan, our goal is to see if we can cut that price by two-thirds. And we think that if we can do that, we can probably encourage more digital amateur television use around the world. Um, one of our plans is both the hardware and the software for this project should be open source. Uh, we plan to make the uh, design source files uh, freely and available, no restrictions. Uh, we're hoping by having these uh, up on the internet that uh, other people will join in and contribute new functions, new performance, and other things to allow the project to continue to grow. So who is the uh, Digital Amateur or DATV Express team? Uh, right now we have five members and we're scattered around the world. Uh, you've already met uh, Charles and myself, uh, Art is uh, located in Columbus, Ohio. He was one of the main spearheads on pushing through digital amateur television for the uh, ATV club there in Columbus, Ohio or Central Ohio. Uh, Tom is uh, located up in Portland. He's uh, doing our printed circuit boards uh, wizard and schematic capture activity. And Charles is uh, one of the software uh, guys uh, located uh, near Art in Columbus. Uh, it's uh, kind of interesting how this project came together and how the team came together. Uh, two years ago, uh, right after the DCC, Art and I were talking and Art was saying, you know, the cost of uh, the hardware is just too much. It's uh, keeping people from using. And he has experience with this, uh, with his local television club that not everybody jumped on board. So I put that away. Uh, he said, uh, you know, if, if I can design a low cost uh, circuit board and have them built if I can find somebody to write the software to go onto the printed circuit board. So I locked that away in my uh, brain and uh, a little bit more than a year ago, uh, Charles had been writing code for a, uh, a software designed radio uh, product and uh, said, boy, I can make things happen in software if I only had a low-cost board that I could uh, port my code to that we could sell at a low cost rather than the high cost of this uh, SDR system that I'm using I would have a great thing so that message got to me uh, we got together and I felt like a matchmaker bringing Art and Charles to, together there and uh, it's been uh, moving forward uh, ever since uh, last DCC so let me give you an overview of the uh, DATV Express system. Uh, basically, we use a commercially available uh, video capture card to do the MPEG-2 encoding. The nice thing about this is uh, you can buy standalone uh, video capture cards that uh, are fairly low cost and even cheaper if you go up on eBay. Uh, we use a PC running either Win, uh, Windows or Linux. And it does the main bulk of the uh, uh, DVBS protocol processing and will output a IQ stream uh, that we'll send over to the board. So hardware-wise, we have a single uh, custom-designed hardware board that's the Exciter. Uh, it does some prepping on the IQ stream. Uh, it uh, basically does the uh, QPSK modulation at the RF range of 1.2 gigahertz. So all you have to do is uh, add a couple power amplifiers and uh, uh, antenna and you have a real live uh, digital amateur television uh, transmitted signal. Here's the block diagram for the uh, DATV system. Uh, on the left is uh, an analog, uh, either an NTSC or a PAL uh, video camera. You connect that to a MPEG-2 uh, video capture card that's doing the MPEG-2 capture or encoding. 
we send that by UP USB over to a uh, computer and the uh, computer can be uh, running uh, either Linux or Windows uh, 32. Uh, the computer will first read the program stream coming in from the encoder. Uh, it will uh, add the SI tables that are part of the protocol. It will do scrambling. It will do interleaving that's required for the protocol. Uh, it will add the forward error correction, uh, and it's adjustable. Uh, it will then take all of the resulting data, map it to an IQ stream, and then we have a uh, graphic uh, user interface uh, to do setup and uh, change parameters for the DVBS signal. It then takes the uh, IQ stream and sends it out the USB port to the hardware board. And uh, the DV, DATV Express hardware board is uh, FPGA based. Uh, it extracts the USB data that's sent to it. It has a, uh, a finite impulse response filter to do shaping on the uh, data stream. It then sends the IQ data stream over to a digital to analog converter. And then basically the uh, finalized IQ stream is uh, sent to a QSP uh, modulator. So the output is about 10 milliwatts uh, using the DVBS protocol in the 1.2 gigahertz uh, RF range. Uh, you have to add a, perhaps a pair of RF power amps to uh, get you up to whatever your final uh, power level is. I've been playing mainly with uh, about 7 to 10 watts of average output power. And just as a kind of a sidebar, uh, one of the things you'll find about digital modulation is that it has a very high peak power to average power ratio. And what that means is, for an example, if you have a nice linear FM RF power amplifier, you're going to only get around 7 or 8 watts of average digital power out of that. Uh, the peaks on the uh, modulation are going up to 30 watts or close to 30 watts, but the average power is staying around 7 or 8 watts. And if you try to raise the average power, you're going to start to compress and flat top the uh, uh, the peaks, and that's going to start to give you distortion and start to cr increase your uh, bandwidth. Well, let's talk a little bit about the software that goes onto the uh, power, uh, onto the PC uh, that we're running. Uh, as we said earlier, uh, it will run either 32 bit or 64 bit flavors of Linux. Uh, when we complete uh, finishing that part of the project, uh, we'll go over to uh, several flavors of Win32. Uh, one of the things that the PC does is it stores the firmware that's going to be loaded onto the USB chip. The USB chip is called a FX2. Uh, it's uh, from uh, Cypress. And not only does it have a USB controller on it, but it also has a little 8051 microprocessor in it. So the firmware for the 8051 is basically stored on the PC and then loaded onto the hardware board uh, when uh, things power up. In a similar manner, uh, the firmware for the FPGA is stored on the PC and then when at the right time, it loads it down to the hardware board. Uh, the PLL for the RF control is actually on the hardware board, but the software on the PC is where you set what frequency you want to go to. And that information is sent over to the PLL. In a similar manner, uh, the symbol rate generator, uh, the hardware is on the printed circuit board, but the software on the PC controls which symbol rate you want to configure your setup for. And we have a uh, user interface and uh, on the computer. And as Charles likes to say, uh, everybody knows that a uh, user interface is how the computer controls the human operator. Uh, continuing on with the PC software, uh, one of the functions that it does is it takes the uh, program slash transport stream that's coming in from the video capture card. It uh, adds the uh, ID 
packets for the uh, transport stream. It adds the SI table information that's required by uh, DVBIS, uh, adds the forward error correction, does the interleaving uh, homework, and it basically tries to keep the symbol rate constant, uh, hopefully no overruns, no underruns, and generates the, uh, the IQ symbols. And then that is sent over by USB to the hardware board. So let's talk a little bit about the hardware board. Uh, it's a single uh, board, a uh, custom design. It uh, preps the IQ stream, uh, does a little shaping on it. Uh, then basically, uh, as I had said earlier, does the uh, QPSK modulation at 1.2 gigahertz. Uh, it gets the data from the PC through a USB port. It has the PLL for the uh, frequency control. Uh, in the same way, it has the uh, hardware to do the uh, symbol rate uh, control. Uh, the output of the printed circuit board is about 10 milliwatts. Uh, we have a little buffer amplifier on it and uh, does a little buffering and uh, boosts the power a little bit. And uh, we have a number of power supplies that are doing DC to DC regulation to allow a single 12 volts to be input to the printed circuit board and then the regulation down to whatever the different ICs require. So as I said uh, earlier, all we have to do is uh, add some RF power amps and an antenna. Here's a uh, block diagram for the uh, DATV Express board. If you start over on the left hand side, this is the uh, USB connector. It sends it over to the Cypress uh, USB controller. This is the one that has a built-in 8051. Uh, the 8051 can send over the uh, uh, programming information to load up the uh, FPGA, or it can be using the FIFO to uh, send the uh, data stream over to the FPGA. The FPGA is at Altera, and the main duties are to uh, communicate with, uh, U with the uh, USB controller to get the USB data, uh, sorts the I and the Q data streams, it uh, adds the FIR filter, and uh, is capable of doing a little buffering in case we have some uh, problems with uh, overruns or underruns. We send that uh, IQ stream to a pair of digital to analog uh, converters. Uh, the I data is sent up to the uh, uh, one of the DACs and the uh, Q data stream data is sent over to the other. We do some final shaping on the output of the uh, DAC and send that over to a QPSK modulator. Uh, that gives us about one milliwatt or so of uh, RF coming out. That goes through a uh, buffer amplifier and sent out through a uh, connector to uh, your amplifiers. If you look in the lower left-hand corner, you can see that uh, there's a cluster of DC to DC regulators. Uh, the biggest one is uh, bringing the 12-volt input uh, down to 5.5 uh, volts. And then from that point, we have a number of uh, regulators. There's a 5-volt regulator. There's a 3.3-volt analog regulator. There's a 3.3 volt digital regulator, and there's 1.2 volts that is used to run the particular FPGA chip we chose. So that kind of gives you the overview of um, what we have on the hardware board that we've uh, designed. And let's talk a little bit about what goes, uh, what coding goes onto the board. As we explained before, this uh, FX2 board has a uh, an 8051 microprocessor. Uh, the 8051 uh, code will be used to program the FPGA. It also manages the uh, uh, FIFO going over to the FPGA. Uh, it has the IC, I2C uh, interface that uh, will uh, control the uh, hardware PLL for RF. And in a similar manner, it has the I2C interface that will control the symbol rate generator and does a little bit of housekeeping. 
Uh, additional code that goes onto the board is the FPGA code. Uh, essentially, it in interpolates the symbols and uh, puts things to the final sample rate. The, uh, it does some shaping of the uh, channel data and finally does the writing to the uh, digital to analog converter. So let's pull all of this together into one page. Uh, here's a kind of a system level spec sheet uh, that talks about what the DATV Express project does. Uh, the project is uh, specs are for DVBS protocol. Uh, we uh, do QPSK modulation. Uh, the frequency range is in the 1.2 gigahertz range and we will cover the full range allowed in the United States or allowed over in Europe. Uh, the symbol rate that uh, we're designed for will run somewhere between, will allow you to adjust between one mega symbol per second and five mega symbols per second. So you can tune it to what your needs are. Uh, the forward error correction is uh, selectable, what configuration you want to be using. The RF will be about 10 milliwatts out buffered to an SMA connector. Uh, the commercial video capture card that uh, we'll try and test and approve uh, will be capable of uh, NTSC or PAL, and uh, we'll list out the ones that we've used. And essentially, the, the goal of the first phase of the project is to desi design this for one video stream. Uh, on the operating system side, the, the specs are that uh, we're going to first work on Linux 32-bit uh, and 64-bit. And then once we have that under our belt, we'll do a couple flavors of Win32. So where are we? Um, for the architecture for our product, our project, uh, we've completed that. Uh, the schematic capture is uh, being done in uh, DX Designer Tools, and we've completed that. Uh, the PCB layout, uh, we're using pads. Uh, tool set and we're nearing completion. So if we look at the next step for this particular project, uh, it's to do a design review on a PCB layout and look at the Gerbers and the drill drawings and all of the things that you need for a printed circuit board assembly. Um, we're hoping, we're very close on this, we're hoping to have the design review uh, this coming week. Uh, after the design review and any uh, last minute change of need, we hope to do some uh, first article blanks of the PCB and then stuff it. Uh, stuff it might be more like glue it. <laughs> uh, it's all surface mount uh, technology fabrication. I think stuff it is a, an old term for through hole uh, connectors there and uh, components. Uh, then, of course, the, the big job is to check out the hardware, see if it really works the way we intended the design, and then uh, start doing the software integration. So uh, we're quite happy with the progress we've made, and uh, we're excited that uh, we're close to having our first uh, uh, article uh, printed circuit board assembly to uh, try out. Uh, one of the questions we always get asked when we uh, talk to people about uh, this particular project, uh, they will uh, ask the question of, uh, well, what about the DVB-T protocol or uh, this uh, new DVB-S2 protocol? And uh, our standard answer is uh, we have designed a software designed radio approach to uh, digital amateur television. Uh, our answer is yes, it's possible. Uh, but this team is right now only committed to uh, doing the DVBS uh, portion of it. Uh, we'll feel like we've accomplished an awful lot if we can do that, and uh, maybe we can get digital amateur television into more hands uh, than are currently using digital amateur television. And of course, we're going to encourage other people to come in with our open source and uh, uh, start uh, moving this thing towards DVB-T or DVB-S2 or whatever their uh, interests lie. 
So let's start going towards a, a conclusion here. Um, Charles has uh, code written for his uh, software designed radio uh, system, the USRP2. Uh, that code will need to be ported over to the final target board. Uh, we need to uh, uh, write uh, code for the, uh, the FX2 uh, loader. Uh, and we need to write the code for the FPGA. Now, we've actually, Charles has been using uh, development boards for the USB controller, and he's been using development boards for the FPGA, and so has uh, uh, Tom up in Portland. But that code needs to be ported to the, the final target board. So uh, we still have that to do. As I said earlier, the uh, the source design files will be made freely available, uh, no restriction. This includes uh, software uh, design files, the uh, FPGA files, uh, the schematic design files, the uh, the net list, the uh, printed circuit board design files, the Gerbers. This will all be made freely available. And if you look at the the progress we've made on the cost of the board, uh, we feel we're on target right now for a, uh, a low-cost uh, DVBS board that was part of our project uh, goals. So as uh, kind of a final part of the uh, presentation, uh, I'd like to leave you with just some uh, URLs. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about digital amateur television, uh, here's some good starting places. Uh, this is the uh, UART uh, for the uh, digital amateur uh, television repeater in uh, central Ohio. Uh, the British Amateur Television Club has an excellent uh, digital forum for ATV or DATV. Um, I've written a large number of articles on digital amateur television for my local radio club uh, newsletter. And you can find the entire library of these uh, digital amateur television on the Orange County Amateur Radio Club website. Uh, this is a very interesting project. Uh, the Digilite project over in Europe is exactly the same type of project that we've been working on. Uh, they started quite a few years ago. Uh, they're kind of a derivative type of a project. They, they, somebody else started a project uh, a long time ago. For example, one of the early pioneers was uh, F4DAY, and then somebody took his design and made it grow a little bit further, like Rob. And then uh, the digital, the Digilite people have kind of taken that, and now they're moving a little bit further on. And so if you look at their website, you can see that they've got their printed circuit board stuffed. Uh, they've got uh, quite a few first articles and they're doing a debug and uh, having a number of people to do tests with it uh, and sounds like they're getting close to uh, uh, scattering this thing around the world so uh, very good efforts uh, going on there in in England or in France and England I think there's other countries involved too and these two country these two companies or, or organizations are quite interesting. These are the two main sources of ham grade digital amateur television uh, today. Um, the AGAF uh, uh, organization out of uh, Germany is basically had a uh, university professor who had a number of uh, free graduate students designed the first boards and this has been happening over a large number of years so they're on about the third or fourth generation of boards. Uh, SR Systems in Germany uh, has excellent products also uh, they're on about their third or fourth generation of uh, uh, DATV products for ham radio. And finally uh, this is a uh, uh, a Yahoo group that's dedicated to digital amateur television uh, has over 250 members that just started up uh, really this summer and uh, uh, a large number of pioneers and uh, people interested from Europe are members. Uh, there's a large number of uh, people from the United States uh, who are members, both experienced and uh, uh, new to digital amateur television. And there's uh, people from uh, Australia and New Zealand. And uh, just a couple weeks ago, had a Japanese a ham 
uh, become a member, and he explained that there's over 50 uh, hams uh, transmitting digital amateur television today in Japan. And uh, I didn't get that input from just Googling around. I, I think something about the English to Japanese or Japanese to English translation just uh, prevented me from seeing those blogs or those articles uh, that are being published over in the uh, Japanese area. Well, that concludes the formal part of our uh, uh, presentation, and uh, we're uh, delighted to go ahead and turn this over to uh, a question and answer uh, session if uh, anybody has any questions. Yes, I'm Bill Fan N4TS. I've been messing with this from a uh, commercial aspect in broadcast news, which we use DVBS, and I'm curious, uh, what, are, what do you anticipate for a receiver for hams to use? I know we were using a lot of Tyran and stuff, and uh, I just wonder what you've come up with for a receiver on it. Charles, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, most people are using standard set-top boxes. They tend to uh, tune down to, um, to two mega symbols per second, which is about the lowest rate that's currently being used. Um, and uh, their IF frequencies are between 950 and about 2.2 gigs. What I've been using is I've been using a USB um, satellite receiver dongle, and uh, the particular one that I've got, as well as doing DVBS, it does DVBS2, and uh, it goes down to uh, to about two mega symbols per second, and um, so uh, that's what we. Uh, anticipate using on receive. You can pick these things up for um, $20 if probably less than that. Yeah, but we don't have those available here in the U.S. like you do in, in well, Europe. Well, yes, yes, you do. You can go to eBay and that's where I've bought about four of them. <laughs> uh, a lot of times they'll carry the name of uh, FTA or free to air uh, type of products, but uh, I use a ViewSat uh, VS2000, and uh, if you look for FTA receivers or DVBS on eBay, uh, you'll find them. Uh, I've bought them anywhere from uh, $50 plus transport to uh, $60 plus uh, shipping. Name is name is Chuck Lipmeyer, KB1HTO. Um, back in '95, I was involved with the Advanced Television Test Center where we approved the ATSC standard for the United States. And I was kind of curious about, um, you know, whether there was any effort to make amateur television, we used to call it ATV, but then it was advanced television. <laughs> um, if uh, there's any effort to make uh, amateur television uh, using the ATSC standard. Uh, let me let me take this one, Charles. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, when I was in the study phase, I wanted to go ATSC. Uh, that was my plan. I hoped, I was confused, uh, should I use DVBS, but you know, why not go the standard that was available in the United States, mainly because you could buy a set-top box for about $40, and uh, that was great. And that wasn't even on eBay. It was probably $10 on eBay today. Uh, and there were boards available out of Germany that would support the ATSC uh, protocol. Uh, the problem is that ATSC uses uh, AC3, the, the Dolby uh, codec for audio. And the problem is that the people in Germany couldn't get a reasonably priced license to add the Dolby sound into the encoder board that they had designed. So they did the next best thing they could. The MPEG-2 encoder board that they use uh, for ATSC uh, ends up using MPEG-2 audio. And it works sometimes. Uh, if you take a, uh, a cheap ATSC set-top box, uh, the audio will not come through. If you take a television, a digital amateur television set that's equipped for uh, cable, uh, you'll probably accept the MPEG-2 audio because the cable people have the codex built into it and that works. So what I found was it was a hit or miss type of a situation uh, if we went down that path. And so uh, I wanted to choose ATSC. Uh, basically, after I put all the pros and cons in front of me, uh, I ended up uh, choosing 
DVBS uh, for our emergency communication work here in California. And another sidebar is that uh, the video, uh, the RF bandwidth is much larger on uh, ATSC. Uh, I, I think maybe you can get the idea of why we chose DVBS, at least here in Southern California. And by the way, uh, uh, so did the amateur television repeater in Ohio, and so did the uh, ATVers down in San Diego, Del Mar. Uh, go ahead. Well, Ken and Charles, I believe that's the end of the questions here. So thank you well, very much. And there's a big round of applause here for you. <laughs> Well, it's been our pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we appreciate everything that Tapper's done to help us tell our story. Well, yes, and if anybody's got any questions that they think of after uh, the presentation, you can always email us. We're more than happy to hear from you. Well, thank you very much, gents. We're going to sign off with you, and we're going to get set up with the next talk. And hopefully, we'll get to see you in person one of these years, okay? But take care, and we're glad that you could be able to present remotely. All right, 73. Thank you. Yeah, 73.